Um, Christy is joining us from um, Nanyang Technological University uh, in Singapore, where she's assistant professor in the School of Art, Design and Media. Um, her research interests combine urban and ethnic studies, mapping and emerging media arts uh, to visualise cultural histories of cities and communities. Um, and Christy is one of the people who we've been thinking and, and were hoping to invite from the very beginning of this, so it's fantastic that you, you were able to find support to come out here, and we were really grateful to your institution for supporting you. Um, and yeah, I should also mention that um, NTU and uh, Christie's Visit is part of a developing strategic partnership between ANU and NTU, um, and yeah, we hope to continue that in the future. Uh, yeah, and Christy, I don't know what the topic of your talk is, but um, you will show us in just a minute, and I'll switch yeah. to your source. Uh, right. And should we dim the lights? Well, thank you so much for the for the invitation. It's really wonderful um, to be here. Uh, I met a few of um, AR ANU colleagues, collaborators last year at a uh, at a um, ANU uh, NTU uh, uh, kind of sharing and symposium session. So it's really a pleasure to to come to ANU as well. So, okay, so with that, I'll get started. Um, so my talk today is about a project um, that's a work in progress, an interactive cultural history and mapping project using new media to explore the spatial ethnography of Singapore. This is part of a larger project visualizing histories of Singapore's ethnic communities. It asks what urban interfaces could be designed to reveal stories that enrich our understanding of everyday spaces. So um, I'll start by saying that much of what uh, constitutes the dynamic of ethnic enclave formation is intangible, as it's largely a lived experience rather than one that is necessarily documented or archived. As such, the project I'm presenting serves as a digital archive and platform for mapping community stories that enriches our understanding of the city and the often intangible narratives of heritage that create a sense of place. The project engages the fields of critical cartography and spatial ethnography, using mapping as a dynamic platform for sharing overlooked histories of ethnic communities and how they claim place in cities. Uh, the term spatial ethnography is most identified with the work of architecture and urban historian Margaret Crawford, whose work on everyday urbanism draws attention to places in the city that are not typically considered glamorous, such as yard sales, street vending, and so on. Other urban scholars, such as Annette Kim, have used spatial ethnography to combine social science research and physical spatial analysis to uncover how sidewalks are used and the social processes of that use in Ho Chi Minh City. So in her book, Sidewalk City, she looks at the sidewalk activities of Ho Chi Minh cities. Um, Kim uses the label critical cartography to describe the subset of map making that aims to bring to the fore issues of power. So these scholars, among others, exemplify a larger spatial turn in critical history, asking us to consider the often overlooked everyday spaces of sociocultural activity in the city, and to ask how mapping can be used in more critical ways to re-see these spaces and to tell new stories about them. This critical cartography literature unmasks the supposed objectivity of maps. Particularly with the advent of open digital platforms, maps have become ubiquitous in our lives and are increasingly being drawn by everyday peoples rather than resting in the realms of professionals. Critical cartographers have created maps which contest the authority of mapping conventions. So, for example, so uh, what Kim and other scholars have stated is that uh, cartography has um, has a link to a colonial and empire building, and so the visualization of place and space is tied to that um, kind of uh, language of, of visualizing um, uh, spatial histories. So social media platforms such as HistoryPin modify Google Maps using an application programming interface or API to share photos and histories of their local communities. So these are becoming much more popular now. Um, other projects such as the Racial Dot Map 
by Dustin Cable at the University of Virginia Demographics Research Group use publicly available data from the 2010 U.S. Census to visualize geographic distribution, population density, and racial diversity of the American people in every neighborhood in the entire country. So this is an interactive map which is color-coded according to the census um, categories, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, or other, and you can zoom into various cities. Um, going to the mi uh, micro level to see, you know, what um, what these demographics look like. So, but in, so in other words, mapping is no longer static, but rather a dynamic system that changes according to the shifts in culture and community that characterize a geographic place. So, another example comes from research that uh, by myself and Annette Kim on mapping ethnic community naming projects in Los Angeles. We found that increasing numbers of ethnic communities have been approaching LA City Council to establish symbolic spaces in the city. So what this map shows, we basically took um, uh, from the archives applications um, from uh, members of the, of the LA community who wanted to rename or name a place according to um, ethnic uh, population. And so there is a official system by which you can do that in Los Angeles. Started actually unofficially and then became official. And you'll see, right, that there are quite a few ethnic named places in Los Angeles. Some that are in process, um, others that have been established, probably starting in the 1980s. Okay, so, um, all right. And this is based on a forthcoming um, article that Annette Kim and I are working on. In 1974, writer Jonathan Raban stated that the city, as we imagine it, the soft city of illusion, myth, aspiration, and nightmare, is as real, perhaps more real, than the hard city one can locate on maps, in statistics, and architecture. So as cities merge technology with urban infrastructure, the hard city has become the hardware city, and the soft city has become software city the local, intimate, human dimension of urban life expressed using digital media. These comprise the spatial narratives of the city layered over time and place. So what I'm presenting here is a, a project that combines mapping and storytelling to explore Asian ethnic enclaves, focusing attention on the complex and multi-layered cultural history of Singapore's ethnic communities. By looking at sites of cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible within the history of the built environment of the city-state. The project is in collaboration with the Urban Redevelopment Authority, um, or URA, which is Singapore's prime, you know, they basically build, decide what gets built and what doesn't, what gets preserved, per preserved and what not. Um, it began as the Urban Renewal Unit as part of the Housing Development Board whose primary mandate was to provide public housing for residents at a time when much of Singapore was comprised of villages or what was called kampongs. And of course now Singapore is largely unrecognizable from what it was back then. And we're talking from 1964. Um, the URAs happens to be headquartered in Chinatown and they have a series of public galleries um, called city galleries that communicate to the general public through exhibitions and other interactives um, what the various planning uh, projects are that the city is up to. And, um, and the project that I'm working on with them is in a new, will be in a new gallery called Mapping Singapore. So these types of exhibitions typically serve as an interface for visitors to learn about the city's plans for the future but in this case, they're about creating a way for visitors to hear and view stories and histories from a disappearing past. Here, digital technologies become a tool by which narratives of place are made visible within an urban landscape that is continually shifting. As such, the interactive web-based project I'm developing showcases a detailed insight into the urban and cultural histories of Chinatown, and later on will be um, looking at other, it's a platform essentially, so it can be built upon and you can look at other um, uh, spaces as well. Not just uh, Chinatown, but others. So it should be noted actually that Chinatown, 
um, was a colonial construct created as an attempt to place order upon the already present multi-ethnic settlements in Singapore. In 1822, Sir Stamford Raffles formed a town committee and began planning a new town according to ethnic groupings, for example, European town, Chinese, Chulia, Arab, and Bugis Kampongs. And new street names were mapped onto this new colonial landscape. However, in practice, the Asian inhabitants and laborers utilized alternative street names that describe the daily activities that occurred on those streets. And so um, a scholar who's looked at this quite uh, closely is Brenda Yeo, who's in, um, in the urban, um, in the geography department at NUS. So there, so in other words, these street names described, there were what, what people called streets um, at that time were based on activity, not based on the names. And oftentimes those names were given to, um, to um, colonial government officials and so on, people like that. So this project aims to provide an alternative narrative mapping that reveals such overlooked ways of being and place making. So though the scope of this project will expand to include other locations, the first iteration will look at Teluk Ayer and Amoy Streets in Chinatown, and that's what's highlighted there. Teluk Ayer means water bay in Malay and refers to the fact that this street once marked the shoreline of Singapore in the 19th century. Singapore during the colonial period was well established as a hub of maritime trade in the region and had an already established diverse immigrant population. Telakaya Street is one of the oldest streets in Singapore and has among the oldest surviving overseas Chinese clan associations and diverse religious cultural heritage sites. These include temples built by different waves of overseas Chinese, like Tian Hock Kang Temple, which still stands today, um, built in the 1820s by the Hokkien immigrant community who came from Fujian province in southern China. So the design metaphor here um, is to create a digital landscape in which the viewer acts as a virtual flaneur, strolling back and forth between time periods to witness the changes on Teluk Ayer Street. Furthermore, images and video excerpts would appear as layered choices above the panorama while the viewer explores the street. In this locational panoramic strip, archival images and videos can be selected to explore the history of this particular place in more depth. On the same street, there are Indian Muslim places of worship as well. These include early shrines established by Tamil Muslims, the Alabar Mosque, was established on the street in 1827, and the Nagar Durga Shrine, which actually today is now um, a cultural heritage museum. Um, and that's a few doors down. And so it shows that you know, these sites of worship show that there was a concentration of Indians in Chinatown, and also um, there happens to be a nearby Chinese Methodist church as well that was built much later. In spite of the colonial town plan to segregate Singapore's ethnic groups, these groups continue to live and worship literally next door to each other. The diversity and proximity of such sites of everyday sociocultural practices are a testament to the always present interactions among the different ethnic groups in Singapore. An example of which is also the Parsi community, which were among the minority ethnic communities who established businesses within Chinatown um, Framra's aerated water factory, which was established in 1903 and highlighted here. This building no longer exists, actually, nor does this one. So, um, so, the, so what Framra's did was uh, create um, basically soda, soda pop, right? And for Singaporeans growing up in the 50s, Framra's aerated waters evokes, invokes memories of a distinct period of time. Okay, so uh, within this project also there'll be a submission section in which um, viewers will be invited to, um, to, you know, using Facebook or Instagram um, to 
to, to say that they have stories related to particular locations, you know, on Teluk Ayer. So if somebody had lived or their parents had grown up in a shop house, they can reach out to us and then we would um, contact them and follow up with uh, interviews and they include some of this material in the project. So for example, it might work something like this. So this is 104 Amoy Street, which used to be um, the home as well as uh, as shop for the Hoki Bachang um, rice dumpling um, business, which the third generation um, owner, Rick Chu, we happened to interview um, recently. So, and I'm gonna have him explain a little bit um, what, what the Hoki Bachang rice dumpling factory was and where they were located. In 48, when my grandfather started to do bacha, he actually rented a small store inside this coffee shop along Amoy Street, 104 Amoy Street to be precise. So 104 Amoy Street is actually a coffee shop. Now it's, it's a spa. Cafe here. The reason why grandfather chose this Amoy Street. Well, Amoy Street in Fu Tian is like Xia Men Tian. So along this Xia Men Tian, it means there's a lot of Hokkien people. So I think the reason why he chose the place, other than it's, it's near to Chinatown, also that um, this place has a lot of Hokkien, where he can sell his uh, bachang too. By just selling in a coffee shop wasn't good enough, so he actually has this elder sibling bring out the cook uh, product to paddle on the street. Where they find there's a place where there's crowd, so people will bring their food or their wares to, to sell at a particular spot. Okay, so as you can see, food in Singapore is one of the richest examples of how cultural heritage is practiced today. And the markets and hawker centers are quite exemplary in this regard. In fact, the hawker centers in Singapore, the UNESCO is, or I mean, Singapore is trying to um, designate hawker centers themselves as a UNESCO World, World Heritage Site. So, um, okay, so the Chinese, Malay, and Indian cuisines that flourish in Singapore are ultimately linked to the regions that were home to the ancestors of today's various ethnic communities. For the Chinese, the food of southern China dominates, and this includes the cooking of Hokkien, Cantonese, Teochew, Hakka, Hainanese, and Fuchao people. For Indians, it's South Indian food, particularly from Tamil Nadu and Kerala, that predominates. The Malays derive their food from their ancestors from the nearby Malay Peninsula, as well as Sumatra and Java in Indonesia. Okay, so you can see. In the year 1948, yeah. when my grandfather started. Right. Okay. So, so we're also going to have, so I'm showing the micro view where you're kind of walking and strolling along, along the shop houses and the streets, but of course there's going to be a macro view as well, an interactive map. Uh, which will allow viewers to compare historical maps of Singapore with contemporary maps. So, so this is these are Teluk Ayer and Moy Street seen from above the Hoki Bachang rice uh, dumpling former location. And you know, for example, you should you would be able to also overlay historical maps, and these provide a way to view cultural, geographic and um, urban changes over different periods of time. So for example, as I said before, Teluk Ayer then used to mark the shoreline right, of Singapore. And starting in the 19th century, a series of land reclamation projects has since extended the shoreline to what we now know as the central business district. So the first, so this is basically when uh, migrants, migrant workers would come, they would basically land on shore, and of course they'd see, you know, from the distance, the temple, um, you know, uh, flick flickering, the lights of the temple flickering a lot from the shoreline, and that you'd kind of land there, and then, um, and then you subsequently try to find the various communities, whether you're Tamil-speaking or Hokkien-speaking, Cantonese, and so on. Okay, so then uh, the first land reclamation happened and extended um, to Teluk Ayer Basin. And then now, of course, it looks, you know, more like this, which is, so this has all now become, you can't even see the ocean on this map, right? So uh, Marina Bay Sands and that whole development is also currently now there. Um, 
All right, so though Singapore's Chinatown was given conservation status only in 1989, the city has since undergone such rapid urban redevelopment since that the area is unrecognizable as compared to only even a few decades ago. The city and its residents have a rich history of cultural memory that inscribe an intangible richness to the urban landscape. This interactive mapping project engages new media to create a greater awareness of the invisible histories of our built environment and the peoples who populate it. It asks what kind of urban interfaces could be designed to communicate with the spaces we move through and what overlooked stories could be uncovered in order to enrich our understanding of these everyday spaces. So positioned as a global city before the term was ubiqui ubiquitously popularized, Singapore can be an exemplary case study for exploring how ethnic communities have become more complex, diverse, and hybrid in ways that reveal a way of reimagining how we identify, interact, and inhabit urban environments today. So thank you. So um, are we taking questions or will we leave that for later? Yeah, we have time for a couple questions, yeah? People have some questions. Question that might be a bit boring. Um, I'm interested in doing a similar project here, but I don't have uh, kind of digital background, so I'm just wondering what tech you um, I'm actually working with a development team um, of designers who, as well as actually, I have um, I have a crew of um, second year undergraduate film students, and so this project is also it's because it's funded through an external grant from the URA as well as through a startup grant um, that NTU um, College has has provided its faculty, and so. So it's a combination of both hiring uh, professionals who, um, who I'm working with, um, as well as web, de you know, web developers who are really coding the back end, really, of this platform, and as well as students. So I'm using this project also as, um, as a space in which uh, students can learn from, from you know, doing production, um, various production projects, you know, processes. Um, they're new to document. Some are new, new to documentary filmmaking, so it's um, it's kind of. But they're quite enthusiastic and also learning very much, you know, a lot about about the city through the process as well. Um, and so, but in terms of so, you, the, I guess to answer your question, it's um, it's also building a team of people um, and and working together. You know, some people will know the software very well, and um, others will be consulting based on content, you know, and so on. So um, it's kind of bringing in various expertise and working together, really, to develop these projects. When you're working with people's stories, are there instances where there's conflict between um, different people's remembered history? Yeah, I actually think um, that 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 there isn't one history, right? Particularly when you're talking about memory, and also memory is um, often flawed, right? If we think about our own memory, like, you know. So, so, but I think you know, I think there is room in these projects for and for contradiction, as well as um, and conflicting um, stories, and I find that actually enriches. The project, rather than trying to find um, find a kind of unified, you know, uh, way of talking about a particular place, because everyone's going to, to experience it differently and have different attitudes towards it. So, so I'm actually in favor of including uh, different kinds of ways of seeing um, these places. Um, is this platform online? It will be online. So we're in development now, and we hope to um, to finish it probably around the end of, around the end of the year. You know, hopefully in November. So part of this project is also so the the people that I'm um, working with and who funded this project are um, part of the um, Heritage and Conservation Management Group. 
So, so these are the people, like I said, they, they, that unit started, that department started in 1989, and they started by uh, figuring out, well, what are we going to try to preserve in Singapore? And so they, they chose um, Kampong Glam, uh, Chinatown area, as well as Little India. So those, those they did simultaneously. And um, yeah, so, so, so in a way, you know, working with them has been interesting because I think they, they don't have an in-house digital media um, um, design, you know, design um, team. They usually uh, outsource these kinds of projects, but framing this as a research project, you know, with, with um, faculty at the university provides a kind of more long-term way of developing these projects rather than in these kind of short-term, you know, um, um, kind of outsourcing to design firms and that sort of thing. So, but yes, yeah, so eventually it will be online. There'll be a mobile app that goes along with it, so you can take it with you onto the actual site and explore there um, or view from your own, you know, devices. Um, um, is there a plan for the sort of long-term life of it? Because it has to be hosted on a website, there yeah. has to be supported. What happens in five years' time, ten years' time, twenty? Yeah. So, um, so you know, um, because a lot of these projects, and as we know, like in academic institutions, many of these projects are funded through soft money, right? So, so it's basically through uh, continual um, sources of grants, right? So, um, so the way that I'm envisioning this, this, this project will be funded for what, about three to five years, right? And, um, and while at the same, but we're starting this with, a, with just a, using Telefire and MOI Street as a prototype um, to show what's possible. And then because it's a platform, you can just add more material. So in the back, it's, so it serves as a way to also look at other streets. You know any street actually, mm -hmm. and so for that, then you can then apply. I apply for another grant, right? So I've got actually another um, uh, grant proposal that, in collaboration with our uh, colleagues in film studies in King's College and and, and US, where um, we're looking at uh, um, old theaters, right, and and movie going audiences in the 50s and 60s in the Malay, you know, Southeast Asian region, focused on Singapore, but then of course it wasn't Singapore at that time, right? Um, so, so, and then some of these movie palaces don't exist, right? They only exist in photos, archival photos. So that can also become another project that could um, be added to this, to this platform. So that's kind of the model that we're using, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, thanks so, so much, Christy. One of the conversations we wanted to have in you know, doing this day is about sort of interdisciplinary research and knowledge. So I just wondered if you could talk about the interdisciplinarity in this project and how you, you know you're, you're you're working with a lot of different bodies of knowledge here across heritage, uh, you know, critical cartography and so on. How how do you how do you work um, and how do you guys position yourself in that matrix of disciplines? Do you uh, do you feel like you're being a kind of a designer working in the design discipline, or is, is your how does your research develop? Um, yeah, so I so so I think of myself more as um, um, a designer that's that's working with these various interdisciplinary uh, scholars or um, and practitioners, but in a way using the design process as, as a way to work through the research, right? So, um, um, so though a lot of the, uh, the scholarly material informs the work, it's also for me a challenge to think about, well, how does this translate into a visual digital artifact, right? That, um, that kind of metaphorically um, alludes to, you know, both the, what the scholarship is talking about, but also, um, also the, the crux of the project. So that's so. So the design is another kind of language, another medium by which you can explore these kinds of research projects. So. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, I'm wondering about food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you touched on it. It seems really powerful to me that, that 
sense of incredible food actually um, describes the place for all the inhabitants that's the thing that they orient themselves around. Um, do you have the means or have you thought of how you can represent that kind of uh, orientation in this project? Um, yeah, we're do I mean, actually, we're, I, one of the things we'll look at, of course, is uh, the uh, markets and hawker centers. The, there was one at the end of Amoy Street, which is an Amoy Street um, um, food, food center, right? And so that was established around the time uh, when hawker centers were also being established in the, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. And the first one actually was, was started in 1971. And it was basically to move a street vending to these hawker centers um, rather than having the street vending. And so, so the Amoy Street, um, actually Rick Chu's interview, there, he's third generation um, uh, making these uh, Hokkien rice dumplings. And their stall is in the Amoy Street um, uh, food center. And so, you know, so he's just one example, right, of a story that combines, you know, History, heritage, and food, um, and you know, I'm sure there'll be others as well. Yeah. So, so I think it's. Something it's, you can imagine mapping, you know, like geographically mapping. Yeah, that that was that's that was a bit. Yeah, that was the initial idea was to maybe focus a bit more on the idea of food, but then you know, but then I got to thinking, well, how do you exactly map food? It's not. It's it's much more. Um, uh, it's like it's a. It's not something that necessarily, like you could map it if it's located, or how do, you, how do you kind of associate food with location, right? And so the way that you can do that, of course, is identifying where the historical markets are, where the hawker centers are. But then if you're going to go within those hawker centers and find out who's actually selling what there, then how do you start to map that? And what, what it is, it's not just about one location. It's actually about the traces and flows of the cultural you know, activities that inform the making of the food, right? So, so then, um, so that's, a, that's you know, something I would certainly invite you know, discussing more. I haven't, I haven't quite figured out a way that that could work um, um, as, a, as a mapping project. Thank you.